Hello and welcome to the Outcome 2 video of the 239152 course, the new course. Um, if you missed the other video, Outcome 1 video, that's going to be before this one. doesn't really matter which order you, when you re view them in really. But um, there's a lot more information in that one that kind of introduces you to the course. Outcome 2, um, very small. It mainly covers just three questions of the actual assessment, but the safety management. Okay, so in outcome one, we discussed understanding the requirements. So we talked about why we would test, when we should test, what certification we would use, and things. But this video is going to cover the second outcome, which is safety management. Okay, so. The learner will understand safety management procedures when undertaking inspection and testing. The criteria, stuff you'll need to know from this outcome. So, the first thing. The learner can identify health and safety requirements which apply when carrying out inspection and testing. That seems simple enough, but this is the problem. Don't simplify it too much. You need to actually be able to describe in detail the actual health and safety requirements so working in accordance with risk assessments permits rams whatever you want to call them safe systems of work you need to identify your client's system of work you need to look at your employer's system of work or your own system of work and you've got to make sure they work together because if your method of work doesn't match the customer's method of work you've got a you've got an issue that you have to solve so you carry a risk assessment you develop a system of work and then you Look at the site. The site might be domestic, the site might be industrial, it might be agricultural, so there are a number of different factors. Make sure they work together. All this should be done at the pre-survey point. You'll determine what tools and equipment you're going to use. Um, standard multifunction testers, MFTs, will be in a good condition, a state of good repair with charged up batteries, calibrated if you religiously calibrate them every year, but sensible sensible instruments, insulated tools, okay? The persons using the equipment should be competent to use the equipment. They should be familiar with the equipment. Um, if you have an electrician who's done the 239152, he's got lots of experience, send him to a job and let him pick up someone else's test meter that morning, he's automatically lacking in competence because he's got to now familiarize himself with the instrument and it's probably not a good idea to be doing that on the client's doorstep. Provision and use of appropriate PPE. This is a this is an important one because don't just say PPE. Um, when it comes to working with electricity, we have to develop a good understanding on PPE because any experienced electrician will know that if you wrap a guy up in gloves and goggles and hard hat and everything, you're you're starting to actually take away. The ability to truly inspect because you're you're covering up the sensors that we use um, so what you need to do is develop a happy equilibrium where you've satisfied the PP requirement for the environment again if you're working on a construction site there's PP for the environment if you're working in domestic then it's a less risky environment from an electrical perspective doing electrical work the PP would mainly be eye protection if there's a risk of arc flash although you probably shouldn't be doing that if there's a significant risk gloves maybe but you know we try to recognize suitable selection of PPE there's actually a, a good book the, um, the this one um, the code of practice for electrical safety management I know it's backwards but you, know, you get the idea uh, the IT code, they've actually put in there a good understanding on live working, um, about understanding the, the hierarchy and that PPE should be right at the bottom with suitable control mechanisms because all inspection testing work is live work really, um, unless you only do continuity measurement. Uh, that's about it really. Reporting of unsafe situations. You need to understand the reporting procedure, you need to understand these, again that would be mapped with the system of work on the site. 2.2. Outline the relevant requirements of the electricity work regulations for safe inspection and testing of the electrical installation. In terms of 
two areas, those doing the work and those using the premises during the inspection. So let's look at the two. It's a requirement for those doing the work to be competent, to be able to, as it says at the bottom there, uh, avoid or prevent danger. Um, to be able to prevent danger, you must work competently. Um, you must have a comp accompaniment that is also competent as well. Um, barriers, enclosures, suitable precautions and all that stuff is all expectations of a, of a competent person. So if you're not a competent person, then you've got an issue. Those using the premises during the inspection, this is something that you would need to consider because if you're working on a site and you're going to open up panels, or you're going to do installation resistance testing, um, creating potential differences within the system, um, you've got to identify risk to persons who are at work and you've got to either remove them from the area or inform the site's responsible persons of these risks allow them to put in safety protocols but you must make them aware of that so you've got to look at who's going to be using the site and this is another key point with the sample survey or the pre-site survey if you go into a factory at one time of day or a one shift pattern and you're then going to send your electricians in to do inspection testing on a different day or a different pattern with a different quantity of staff or a different method of work on site then you've got a problem because it's not been properly assessed or the risks haven't been properly controlled so do make sure that the working conditions of the site and the environmental characteristics of the site when you do the work are fully understood then you can try to assess the risks to persons during the inspection there's electric risks there's also building risks you know um, shutting down emergency lighting shutting down lifts, escalators, all these all sorts of things. So there are, you know, there's there's other factors to consider here. 2.3. Describe the procedure for completing safe isolation in accordance with the guidance. It doesn't say know how to do it. You know you need to know how to do it for the practical, but this actually wants you to be able to word it. So you need to actually understand the procedure and be able to write it down which fundamentally you should be able to do for a a ram or a risk assessment anyway you know you wouldn't you shouldn't just say i do safe isolation procedures you should actually state the process and you should make sure the process is working okay so this little this little diagram here is the common one if you google it you'll find similar examples of this diagram um it'll always start with planning the work effectively securing isolation so you may need to obviously get labeling or get drawings to identify the point of isolation whatever but find the point of isolation and secure it the method of securing it is obviously a a suitable lock-off device uh, labeled etc fitting warning labels okay so grab the proving unit test it and prove it we're going to cover all this in the live testing videos anyway but you need to be able to write down the process and the key thing is if it's single phase or three phase because if it's single phase it's the three terminations line to neutral line to earth neutral to earth if it's three phase you've got the 10 so you've got neutral to earth and you've got line one to neutral line two to neutral line three to neutral you've got line one to earth line two to earth and line three to earth and then you have line to line so line one to line two line one to line three and line two to line three so there are 10 in all and you need to make sure that you can actually jot them all down in a way that you can describe it well. So have a little practice with that maybe. 2.4 mm. Explain why it's carried out for protection of the inspector and other persons. Okay, so there are again two people here, the inspector and other persons. Um, it's all about controlling risk. Um, the management health and safety at work regs require employees to make suitable efficient assessment of risk we think about things like permits to work permit to works must only be permitted for safe work we do not permit live work we sanction live work so if you're going to do work under a permit to work you must prove it as safe and to prove it as safe you must prove it dead so proving it it's very important for a person doing the work who is being permitted the work to be working safely for other persons similar concept we've got to make sure that a person's working adjacent to the part where we're working is safe 
could be other contractors working on the plant. You may have multi-lock hasp, where you have yourself isolating, you have someone who works on the mechanical or other electrical, or maybe part of the air or anything, who's also at risk, who needs to also control the isolation point. So the isolation procedure is carried out for a number of reasons for a number of persons. And this is the last slide actually for this outcomes. Again, it's only small. 2.5, identify the implications of not carrying out safe isolation. Okay, well in relation to the inspector, uh, electric shop, really. Um, to do suitable inspection would require suitable access to connections and inspections of um, connections in bunch trunking and all sorts and if any of that equipment's not isolated and is energized you manipulate damaged cabling there there are there are increased risks um, other personnel yeah this could be your accompaniment it could be people on site um, factory workers again you go to a factory adjacent to a factory worker you open up the panel you start work if you become energized under load and they are in arms reach of you they may become energized under load so um, yeah so you gotta look after other personnel customers and clients same thing okay there's obviously a legal um, accountability as well there now with regards to the public there's risk of electric shock there's risk of um, of danger with them being unfamiliar as well you can have a panic um, and they kind of link also to building systems removal of supply again we've got to think about turning off lifts turning off escape routes turning off escalators shutting down lighting if we shut down lighting and they they lose the required lux levels for their escape routes or anything like that which again is a very common thing I'm seeing at the moment where people just discharge a system fully drain the actual uh, the batteries for three hours and then turn it back on and they carry on working on a de-energized battery system which is you know brilliant but um, yeah so you're affecting the building systems you've got to make sure that the public and the people at work are properly uh, protected by those systems either temporary systems or there's a gap in work or there's a, an accountable um, distance of safety put into place okay but you've got to identify the different risks that can be uh, passed on to these people if you were not to carry out safe isolation all right from a safety perspective those are the main concerns in this outcome there's nothing else here okay so the requirements if you have a good read that there's, there's good guidance in HSR 25 on that the um, this document here there's also some guidance you got GS 38 you should have a good understanding on that anyway have a good read of that um, that you can see here I've mentioned reference to where they are in guidance notes on this so just cross reference that to a bit of reading guidance notes 3 and you'll be fine with that one have a practice with this one you know get to understand the safe isolation procedure but just try writing it down in a bullet point fashion and they should, you know, the, the single phase, three phase are exactly the same except for the tests themselves, where you have three and ten. That's all they're going to challenge you on with this. Okay, this is one of those things really where experience is needed instead of, you know, just writing it down, to be honest. So we'll cover this in practical more. Explain why it's still carried out. Okay, yeah. And the implications of not carrying out on these people. Yeah, okay. Okay, I think I think that's enough on that. Um, if you wanted a bit more fairly useful read material on this, I haven't put any mention of it here, but if you go to Electrical Safety First Best Practice Guide on Safe Isolation, I don't know if that's number four, is it? Best Practice Guide four? I can't remember. But if you Google Safe Isolation Procedure, you'll find there Best Practice Guide. They've got good examples as to why Safe Isolation Procedures should be carried out. So by all means, familiarize yourself with as much content as you can. All right, that's um, that's outcome two. We're gonna move on to outcome three in another video, and the reason I mean I'm keeping this one short because the next one is just relating to the requirements for inspection, and that will be quite wordy. And then um, 
there'll be another one for testing which will be wordy again um, this this performance one is where we'll we'll do some practical videos on it but uh, the next video is going to be an inspection video all right so I'll crack on with that as soon as I can and I'll see you on that one okie dokie bye bye